It's on. Hello, everybody. And, wow, that is love. <laughs> that used to be a mic. Thanks for coming. Uh, so don't you just love it when technology just unexpectedly fails and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it? <laughs> I mean, I can't think of the number of times I've told myself just like, I thought computers were supposed to make my life easier. You know, I think, you know, maybe to the last talk, I think we rely a little too much on our digital lifestyles, all right? So it, it's not that I don't like technology. I love technology. As an architect, there is no way we could build the buildings we do today without all sorts of new technology in the form of building systems and tools that we use every day. We can make buildings that are full of devices that are constantly balancing and monitoring heating, cooling, ventilation, and lighting to provide optimal comfort for people as well as to balance energy efficiency. It is really fun to get to work on these kinds of things. But at the same time, there's a new norm that we need to consider when it comes to our buildings, and that's the ever-changing climate impacts that our world is now experiencing. So a lot of these changes and impacts aren't exactly new to us. They're just happening in totally, <laughs> totally unexpected ways like that. <laughs> right? They're, you know, they are just happening more frequently. They're happening uh, in more severe ways. They're happening in places that we've never even experienced them before. Just look at the thousand year flood that South Carolina experienced last week. This is a big challenge for all of us. And what is interesting here though is that these kinds of events are somewhat familiar to us. So because of that, we should have the ability to better prepare our communities to withstand and recover from these kinds of events. That is what we call being resilient. So it's the ability to become strong and healthy again after something bad happens. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're blocking out the event altogether. It's rather that you have the ability to absorb the impact in a safe way and then be prepared and ready to recover and recuperate quickly afterward. So being resilient for buildings is simple. It just means providing shelter during and after that storm or big event. Now, that's a little more than just keeping a roof over your head and a floor above water. It means providing access to food, water, sanitation, social connectivity, and most importantly, a livable, providing a livable indoor environment. So this last area of the livable indoor environment is where I spend a lot of my time thinking and, and doing research. And I definitely think that technology can help us produce more resilient buildings in this regard. Again, we can't rely on the technology exclusively. So for instance, we all like being warm in the wintertime and cool in the summertime. And our modern heating and air conditioning equipment can definitely do that for us. But what happens when the power goes out? Right? New York City alone has experienced two major blackouts in the past 12 years, one in August of 2003, and then a bigger one after Superstorm Sandy hit in 2012. After Sandy, there were parts of New York without power for weeks. And remember, it was November, and it got cold. So if you have heating, some people might say, well, hey, we still have natural gas. You know, as long as I keep the pilot light lit, I'm good to go. Not really, right? Modern heating equipment uses electric pumps and electric fans to move that heat around your building. So if you don't have power, you don't have heat. And if you're lucky enough to have that emergency generator, well, you better hope you have access to gasoline. If you remember after Sandy, the long gas lines, they didn't have that either. So what can we do? There are passive strategies in building design that we can incorporate into our buildings to provide livable conditions inside without power. So for passive heating, a great example is increasing your building's insulation while also including more massive materials inside to collect and store solar heat from the sun. So that might be you know, a concrete floor or a tile floor up against a bunch of south-facing windows where a lot of sun comes in. These are simple ideas. We've had them for a long time. It's just we need to sort of recalibrate the way we do this in regards to our high-tech buildings. Now, when it comes to cooling, unfortunately, we are getting more and more reliant on air conditioning in our buildings. And 
this almost always runs entirely on electricity. So when we're out of power and we're thinking passive cooling, it's a little different. Unlike heating, we can't use the sun or say a fireplace to cool our building, it's not gonna work. So we're looking more to collect cool temperatures like at night and then block out the heat that happens during the day when the sun is out. But on top of this, we're having to deal with the fact that our design industry and our building industry seems to get a little obsessed lately with these all glass buildings or a lot of glass in our buildings even in residential towers in New York, this is this picture. And a lot of times these don't have very many, if any, windows that open up. So when the power goes out and that air conditioner is completely useless, these glass boxes turn into greenhouses. They overheat even on a cool, sunny day, even like t today. On top of this, air conditioning a building is typically way more expensive than heating one. And so a lot of people just can't afford it and they don't have air conditioning in their buildings. So we need to think, keep these things in mind and design buildings that can keep a cool environment enough to occupy when there is no air conditioning. And we need to definitely think about this in relation to heat waves, right? Storms get a lot of attention, rightfully so, hurricanes. Heat waves, a lot of people don't realize, are the deadliest weather event that we see and experience in the world. When New York was experiencing that blackout in 2003, Europe was just getting into the deadliest heat wave we have ever seen on this planet, at least recorded. 70,000 people or more died in Europe in like three weeks. That's a big deal. We need to be better prepared for these kinds of events. And technology can definitely help us in that regard in the sense that we have new analysis techniques and tools to allow designers to evaluate how a building performs in these kinds of conditions so that we can make data-based education or uh, educational choices in how we can build a resilient building. So let's look at our little glass building again, right? So remember, not a lot of windows that open up, a lot of glass, air conditioning all the time. So if we look at that building in this study that I worked on during a blackout condition that also corresponds with a three-day heat wave, which is three days of 90 degrees or more during the day, what happens? Inside, we're you know, doing pretty well until that blackout, and then suddenly that interior temperature escalates rapidly. It does lose a little bit at night. The temperature goes down a bit, but the building just can't lose that heat fast enough. So before you know it, you are well over 100 degrees inside all the time. This is what we call temperature drift. And so if we think of the same exact building and just change it to have a little bit more operable windows, to have cross ventilation between the rooms, not everything closed up, and to most importantly have exterior shading to block out that sun before it even comes in to heat it up, you can drop those temperatures dramatically. And so interestingly and admittedly, the temperature isn't what we might call normal comfort uh, in this case, you know, you're in the 80s, but at least your building isn't gonna send you to the hospital. So again, simple ideas that don't use a lot of power that can help us keep our buildings more resilient. We need to consider them in relation to our high-tech projects now. So maybe a more simple way to think of this big idea is, you know, when you're a kid, you don't just throw your favorite toys away just because you got a bunch of new ones, right? You might want to play with those things again. So we want to make sure we're keeping these things uh, with us. So I'm going to pose a question to you I often pose to my students in class, and that is, if you have a double hung window, what is the best way to open this window to cool your space? I know at least one of you in here knows it, so I'm not going to let you answer it because I know you know that question. You got it, right? So the top and the bottom. When it's cool outside, you open the top, the hot air goes out the top, the cool air comes in the bottom. Hot air rises, goes out the top. If you open just one, that happens too, but it happens way less fast. You know, it's not as fast. And so this is the most effective way to do it. Um, and you can tell a lot of people forget this, um, simply because not everybody always answers the question, but also because when you buy windows now, they only have a half screen, right? You can only, can't open both windows with a half screen. So the moral of the story, buy full screens. But more importantly, you want, as we sort of march forward with all our new technology, let's not forget about these things we already have that work pretty well when times get tough. So thanks. <laughs>